Good evening. I want to welcome everybody to this uh, week's session of Happy Hour. Very pleased to have uh, Dr. Justin Bandino uh, hosting the session. Justin is uh, trained in dermatology and dermatopathology and currently serves as the program director for the military training program, very large training program in San Antonio. Uh, Justin has a number of years of experience and uh, has been able to do some uh, mission trips, uh, medical mission trips. And so he's going to be uh, uh, speaking to us this evening, sharing with us some uh, tropical infections and uh, kind of some unusual uh, parasitic infections. So I hope you find this session helpful. As always, if you have any questions, uh, if you're watching it live or at a later date, please feel free to send them to education at sagesdx.com or you can email me directly. T. Davis uh, at sagesdx.com. I'll be checking the chat at the end of the, the uh, session and uh, certainly will address any questions at that time. So uh, without any further hesitation, I'll turn the, uh, the floor over to Justin. Justin? Welcome to the Sages Happy Hour. I'm Justin Band. You know, I'm a dermatologist and dermatopathologist. Uh, in the Air Force. I'm the program director for the residency program in San Antonio and also work with SAGES. And uh, uh, the goal today is to review some uh, unknowns that are infectious or infestations in nature. Um, you know, the unknowns, of course, were already pre-published. Uh, and the goal when you assess those is like real-world dramatopathology to be unbiased, not of any clinical, uh, really just kind of go straight to the slide. Uh, but today the goal is, is really to, to push through some clean path correlation, throw some clinical in there, do some education. Uh, I have a lot to get through, so I'm going to go kind of fast uh, to include some of the slides. You know, I'll just kind of flip through very quickly. And then this is pre-recorded and, and will be uploaded to YouTube. So you can always pause if you want to dig into a reference or something. Um, and uh, of course, since it's pre-recorded, I'm also not going to be able to answer any questions live. Uh, but appreciate your attendance and thank you to the Sages for allow allowing me to participate. So let's go ahead and dive into the first case. Let me share my screen here. All right, so the first case was a 40-year-old male with a history of untreated HIV and AIDS. You can see the CD4 uh, count was very low and had a lot of complications. And he presented the ER with three weeks of some pretty significant systemic symptoms there, but then also had a rash. Um, and so the... Uh, on, on clinical exam, the patient had several grouped one to three millimeter vesicles, um, so like tiny little blisters with underlying erythema involving the entire trunk, and also some unroofed vesicles, excoriations. The thought due to all those vesicles um, was disseminated zoster and, and you know, maybe some sort of drug exanthem, but unlikely. So a biopsy was performed. So this is the case that uh, you would have reviewed of unknown. We'll kind of flip this around here a little bit. Um, and this is a shave biopsy, and you can see that it is, you know, at scan, um, an interface dermatitis. There's a, there's a lichenoid band here, um, and it's not the most dense uh, ever, and it's actually not as blue as you might think of your typical lichenoid band. There's actually a reason for that. Part of the reason is that the, <clears throat> the lymphocytes are a little bit atypical. Now, not atypical lymphocytes like you'd expect for mycosis fungoides, because they're cytologically atypical, but they're just a little large, or they're almost, uh, the, the nuclei are almost a little large, like almost like histiocytes. And so that creates what's called the atypical lymphocytes or lymphocytes with ample cytoplasm. And that can give it a little bit more of an amphiphilic look, but it does look like it's really an interface dermatitis. However, um, in some areas, and, and this isn't the only cut, but in some areas, there also was um, almost like a, a, some a, epidermal acanthosis and, and almost like a psoriasiform appearance. And that's actually a foot stomper that I remember being taught that, uh, you know, when you see, you know, for this condition, which we'll get to, when you see a combination of two somewhat counterintuitive um, uh, inflammatory patterns, you really want to think of this diagnosis. And so, you know, psoriasiform or epidermal acanthotic, um, uh, you know, epidermal acanthosis, doesn't really go with interface. Interface usually is creating epidermal uh, thinning and, and kind of um, um, effacement of the Reedy Ridge pattern. So those two things don't go together. 
Plus, um, this, it's not super prominent, but this does have a little bit of a busy dizzy dermis as well. Uh, and that's a little odd and atypical for a lichenoid or interface dermatitis, or certainly a psoriasiform process. Now, as we look closer in here too, we can see definitely again, that interface process. And um, we, we see, you know, all of these cells here that are um, essentially, you know, with ample cytoplasm, but still lymphocytes. Now, another thing that's odd that sometimes it's hard to see um, something that's that's not there, but uh, one of the things that you may notice as you're scanning around is you know, where are the lumen of the vessels, right? So typically here you have a lot of you know small little capillaries, especially up in the dermal papillae, but where are the lumen? Normally we see the lumen. We can even see the red blood cells within them typically. Um, if this was looked more psoriasiform, it's actually a feature of psoriasis sometimes is to see the rouleau formation or some of the red blood cells um, kind of in those dilated um, dermal papillae vessels. But here we just see these amphiphilic lymphocytes. So atypical, we see endothelial swelling, essentially, uh, essentially obliterating the lumen, the interface dermatitis, the busy dizzy dermis. Um, if we search around, you know, we might even find some newts in the horn. There weren't really much in this particular cut. Um, we'll just kind of scan back out here. Um, but all of those features, and then there's kind of one last one that a lot of times we'll, we'll think about with this condition. Um, if you zoom in really close, you start to look around, um, you might see some plasma cells. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm not uh, going to, you know, uh, search uh, ad nauseum here, but, you know, there are some plasma cells within this uh, interface, but, the, but uh, they're not required for this diagnosis. And so, you know, we don't see a whole lot of um, apoptotic keratinocytes, although you can occasionally see that with this uh, diagnosis. Um, we don't see a neoplasm, of course. We don't see a bunch of neutrophils that are... Um, you know, sub epidermal or subcorneal, almost like an immunobolus process. This doesn't fit with AGEP or, um, you know, Sned Wilkinson or you know, some of those entities uh, that you might, might be clinically on the differential. So now moving on, uh, these are just some snapshots I took of, of another section of this case. So here you can see again a lot of those similar features, except definitely some newts in the horn, which is also a, a common feature with this diagnosis. Uh, just kind of moving through uh, a lot of the same things we saw. And then there are maybe some rare uh, apoptotic keratinocytes in there. Uh, definitely some plasma cells in here. You kind of see the little halo next to it. You try to search for the little clock face nuclei um, or, or Yoshi egg or whatever you uh, learning uh, tool you prefer. And so the differential um, from a dermapath standpoint, you know, perhaps you could think viral or maybe some sort of drug xanthem. The, the vesicles were um, unusual for what this ended up being, which is syphilis. Um, and so uh, we ended up uh, for this case, you know, of course, throwing on some special stains. First, we got a, a Steiner, which is a, um, a silver stain. It's a special stain. Now this is zoomed in at 60X, which a lot of microscopes, you, you just don't even necessarily have your run in the middle 60X um, uh, um, magnification. And here though, you can see all of the little spirochetes. Um, that's the little gray stuff. This dark black, um, uh, uh, you know, dendritic processes, those are just melanocytes. So the silver stain is gonna pick that up. Um, whereas all the fine little gray uh, here is is actually the, the spirochetes. And, and so this was a case of syphilis. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there's a couple of uh, teaching things about this case. Um, this is uh, actually a 2X um, magnification of a treponemal um, immunostain. So just kind of a quick plug for why we do immunostains now is, is, you know, many reasons, but one is also just the simp simple visibility. I mean, from 2X, now this was a robust case of syphilis. This is yet another uh, sample. There's multiple biopsies done um, in kind of different sections. Um, you can see this is more like that excoriated vesicle or, or even maybe pustule that was there. But I mean, all the red staining there is the positive syphilis. You can really see, it's actually kind of cool to see why you get the endothelial swelling. You can see it kind of highlighting around a lot of the, the vasculature there, but of course also at that dermal epidermal junction. And all the, the again, the positivity there, that's that same 60X magnification there around the vessels. 
So uh, just a quick kind of clinical um, and even clinical path correlation teaching point, you know, syphilis is traditionally not supposed to be vesicular bolus in adults. It is for, for um, congenital syphilis or, you know, maybe neonatal syphilis. Um, <clears throat> And, you, and this was even taught in, in old uh, textbooks uh, that they're not really supposed to be due to secondary uh, syphilis in adults if, if they're vesicular bolus. Uh, just another um, case there. Uh, this was actually the clinical pictures uh, later as, as the patient progressed, it became more like your classic um, kind of gut tate, uh, you know, this, um, uh, you know, these, these kind of salmon colored uh, papules, um, almost, you know, gut tate psoriasiform uh, distribution over the trunk and extremities. Um, and, uh, you know, that papillosquamous differential there. So then again, just, you know, flying through some quick comparisons here, I think it's a great example of the, the T-PAL versus um, the this, this Steiner. I mean, you can barely even see it even here on 40X. Uh, you have to kind of know what you're looking for. And, uh, but there on 60X, you can finally really, really see it for, for the Steiner. The, the other teaching point for syphilis is that, uh, you know, we learn about all these common features and, and I was able to point out a lot of them. Um, but sometimes we really zone in on the neutrophils in the horn, the plasma cells, when in fact those are not necessarily going to always be present. And there was a great study done back in 2015 by Alston et al. and um, or Flam et al., but with, uh, with uh, Dr. Alston, and it um, looked at the frequency of different histopathological features. And you know, again, I'm trying to kind of really fly through these cases, but I did want to highlight that. You know, again, we think of plasma cells and newts in the horn. Um, you can see newts in the horn there is only in 30% of their cases. Uh, and you can see the most common uh, features actually there are, are um, the top you know, five there. More the inflammation, the, the um, busy dermis even, the interface damage, and feel swelling, irregular acanthosis. And it, in some cases of syphilis are very subtle. And in those subtle cases, um, you know, really your, your most sensitive uh, specificity is going to be in the interstitial inflammation, so that busy dysidermis, and the endothelial swelling and, and the vacuolar pattern or some sort of interface. So that's the first case. Moving on to the second case. <clears throat> this was a 67-year-old male with a history of bilateral lung transplant. And you can see he was on the different immunosuppressant medications there. He developed this red scaly patch on his wrist three weeks prior, and so he was admitted to the hospital just a few days before he was seen uh, uh, and had this worsening progressing wrist lesion. It was started on numerous antibiotics, but the wrist lesion progressed, and so they did a punch biopsy. Here's a picture, kind of this angulated erythematous scaly um, you know, patch that's there, just not healing uh, despite antibiotics. So now this is the, the case uh, that, uh, that you would have seen. Okay, we'll kind of orient here. And, you know, from scan, you can see uh, this is, um, and this is actually not a punch biopsy. This is actually a, a more of an incisional biopsy um, for, as like a representative example. Um, but, uh, you know, we can see here that there's something going on in the dermis. Um, and we're not exactly sure what it is. So, of course, we'll zoom in. But from, the, you know, one of the teaching points here is that, uh, again, from scan, and as you, even as you get in zoomer in, it, as you zoom in, it, it has this appearance of, of a paniculitis. And, and it essentially, it is causing a paniculitis, but that's not the main problem. Um, but again, as you, as you zoom in, you see almost like this bluish saponification, ghost cells. I mean, it really can mimic a pancreatic paniculitis. And you might kind of go down that route or potentially even gouty change. And it would, not as much here, but if you saw more like this feathery crystals, um, you might be uh, sucked down the pathway of thinking it's just gout. Um, but hopefully you see everything else that's going on here, which is a suppurative and granulomatous um, inflammatory pattern, which of course that really needs to push you down a certain differential. And lots of giant cells here, tons of giant cells. And then as you zoom in, hopefully it pops out at you the, all of the organisms. They're everywhere. So it's particularly in the separative and granulomatous areas, but then also over here in this area of the ghost cells and saponification um, that we're seeing. So now these are broad, non-septate hyphae. You know, if you put your germ path goggles on, you can imagine that. You know, some of them are branching um, at right angles, which I mean, we do see that here. Um, so more at the, the right angles versus an acute angle. Um, yeah, maybe like here is a great example. And then, um, you know, these, you do have to remember that, that um, you know, be careful that aspergillosis as it's dying or fusarium can look very swollen uh, and non septate like this. But this is much more classic 
for um, mucor or the zygomycoses. So you know, kind of zoom back out here and move on. Uh, and this was this was actually the, the actual punch biopsy from that patient. Uh, same thing here. You, you might get uh, you know sort of zoned in on that the the, the sub Q uh, focus their little lobule. Um, and and some paniculitides do have neutrophils uh, or neutrophilic inflammation. For example, pancreatic paniculitis can have a neutrophilic inflammation. So you know not unreasonable to go that route. But once you see the granulomas. Uh, that several granulomas inflammation, plus, uh, of course, hopefully you, the, the organisms are kind of pop out at you, um, then you know that uh, you know, that's really the box that you're in. So again, just some great um, photo mics here of, of that separate granulomatous infiltrate, lots of organisms, the broad non-septate hyphae, branching at uh, right angles, um, and just uh, cool pictures there, 60x. Uh, there's a, um, which we did in a brown and red, um, which we don't really need that. That's, of course, to look at bacterial stain, but it does happen to highlight some of the hyphae there. Um, so remember that the, you know, as astragalosis and, and fusarium are dying, they sometimes can degenerate and look more like a zygomycosis or mucor. And then also uh, coccidio, um, you know, if, if, if some of these mucor are cut on end transversely, um, they were very round and, and a similar size of like an empty spherule of coccidia, so be aware of that. Um, and uh, the teaching point here is that fungal infections can induce a paniculitis-like findings. That's been reported, particularly pancreatic paniculitis and gouty paniculitis. Uh, Aspergillosis can do the same thing, so just to, to kind of be aware of that. There's some different thoughts on why that might occur, um, but to, again, just to, to be aware of that. Now, the third case uh, is a 24-year-old male soldier recently returned from deployment to Afghanistan with a boil on the posterior neck that won't heal. And here's the clinical of that. It's kind of this uh, almost eczematous um, uh, looking patch uh, or plaque, a little papule there. You can definitely uh, palpate that, um, about two, three centimeters. And um, you know, it's not healing. And it's, it's not really growing or spreading or marginating out, but you'd want to think of tinea and other infectious things clinically. So now we get a biopsy, and this is what we see. Um, let me flip this around. There we go. So uh, from scan, you know, you see some um, what almost uh, appears to be pseudoepithelialmatous hyperplasia. That can be a hint that there's some sort of chronic inflammation going on or, or, or abrupt inflammation as well. Um, uh, you know, PEH with pus, right, brings up a whole differential. There is a lot of serum, some hyperkeratosis, probably some newts up here in the horn as well. We don't actually see microabscesses in the, the PEH, uh, but you still maybe want to kind of be thinking down that um, pathway of PEH with pus. And that, of course, uh, brings up, you know, a whole differential. Um, but hopefully your eyes really light on, the, you know, that there's something going on here in the dermis. Now, maybe you're still uncertain if, if this is an oma or an itis, you know, maybe you could think, is this some sort of signet ring liposarcoma or some sebaceous, you know, carcinoma or clear cells, you know, uh, um, carcinoma or something like that. But with all the inflammation, um, and then as you get in closer, you should see some pretty brisk um, you know, granulomous inflammation, often there's many plasma cells. You can see that here, that there's just tons of plasma cells um, all over the place, a little clock face, a nuclei, a little um, uh, paranuclear halo of Hoff. Um, and then, of course, we also start to see the organisms, right? So all the little dots that are here, um, and, and they're, they're sort of lining up these vacuoles. Um, they often line up the, the periphery, right, and, and form that marquee sign. Um, and that's unlike the differential, uh, one of the primary differentials, which would be a histo. Uh, so this is not histo, but uh, in histo, typically the organisms are more typical, are, are like evenly spaced and surrounded by a pseudo capsule. Um, whereas with this entity, uh, which is a leash, um, they, they kind of uh, go around in that marquee sign. And when, when the vast majority of them do that, then that's certainly um, uh, supportive of leash. Obviously, you're going to find some vacuoles where there's some organisms kind of throughout more evenly spaced, but the vast majority is it's the, the marquee sign. Again, lots of plasma cells, that infectious um, uh, appearance from scan. Uh, so this is just a really good case of leash. And um, 
you know, that's something common, actually, not, not that uncommon, you know, especially when we would get soldiers coming back from um, Iraq and Afghanistan, um, so more um, old world leash, um, and uh, you can just have kind of a cutaneous focus uh, from getting a bite, um, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, it would kind of be there and need to be treated when they return. Um, now, remember too, from a derm path standpoint, uh, there's the whole parasitic site differential, uh, pH curl being one of the mnemonics. Uh, you can see the different uh, things to consider there. Uh, and of course, leash and histo are, are on that uh, differential. All right, so again, just trying to fly through these for the sake of time. Case number four is a 21-year-old male soldier who presents with right hand swelling and an ulcer along the inner space between his index and middle fingers. Further questioning revealed that the young man enlisted in the army a year prior from the Federated States of Micronesia. You can see there a pretty profound clinical image of the, that ulcer kind of in the web space. Um, and then, um, you know, further exam, you kind of look around, he's got this eruption of annular erythematous, slightly hypoesthetic plaques on his arms, limbs, and trunk, even had thickening of peripheral nerves, uh, particularly the greater auricular nerve. And so a punch biaster was performed of one of the representative, um, somewhat eczematous plaques uh, on his arm. Here's some of those eczematous plaques. Uh, again, a little bit hypopigmented, or at least dispigmented, uh, kind of eczematous. You might think of tinea or some other, or maybe some eczematous condition. Um, but that hypopigmentation is very characteristic, plus, of course, the fact that these are hypoesthetic. Um, and then th this is a, a very classic sign. Um, so the, the, the thickening of that peripheral nerve in here, the greater regular nerve. So this is what you were uh, seeing on um, biopsy. And again, from scan, kind of immediately think of, um, you know, some sort of inflammatory process. And, and, and based on the amphiphilic nature, the tight bundles, the, the relative paucity of other inflammation, we're kind of thinking of tuberculoid granuloma. These are a bunch of histiocytes. You know, it wouldn't be wrong from scan to think of an oma. Um, histiocytes can sometimes look like melanocytes, so they can be hard to distinguish. So maybe you're also keeping some sort of oma in, in, the, in the back of your mind as a possibility. But as you get closer in, hopefully you realize that these are large granulomas made up of histiocytes, a little bit of some mixed inflammation in there. These would be the scantily clad uh, granulomas, perhaps, if you want to use that, um, uh, that, that term. But then once you see, I'm going to start using this marker just to make sure uh, that I have the pointer's working. You know, once you see these, um, uh, these, these actual giant cells forming, right, um, then that's, uh, you know, you know that you're in a, the granulomatous box. Zooming around a little bit. So these, uh, the other thing that's very um, notable with this is it can be hard to find them, although we probably have a little bit down here. Um, these, these tuberculoid granulomas seem to be forming around at nuxal structures and then even small nerves. Now, down in here, there might be uh, some actual nerves, um, but uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of grouped around at nuxal structures, small nerves. You might find um, that the that the granulomas are, or even if you get this perfect cut, these sort of longitudinal, east to west, kind of left to right, um, you know, lavender sausages, some people call them, um, in terms of uh, uh, the overall appearance, and that is very indicative of this infectious condition. So again, kind of form around these actual structures, and then if you search around, and we don't have time to go in, in you know, on a uh, in detail uh, hunt, but uh, there are some uh, tiny little nerves that are, are uh, that you can see, and even in deeper neurovascular bundles, if you cut through and you would see that the, the granulomas are forming around that. Um, there are some plasma cells in here as well. And so um, this is a tuberculoid granuloma differential. And so, you know, could be sarcoidosis, although that's a um, diagnosis of exclusion. But when you get those, um, you know, east to west lavender sausages, which we didn't necessarily see perfectly here, but when you, and when you get the, the um, tuberculoid granulomas uh, around adnexal structures and possibly even nerves, um, then that's when you, um, uh, want to think of other things on the differential, particularly leprosy. And so this is a case of tuberculoid leprosy. Uh, this is 
Um, another um, slide, I, I only I actually put one in, um, uh, you know, for you guys to look at as unknown. Here you, you can kind of see maybe a, a little bit of the, um, of this kind of left to right uh, sausages, uh, lavender sausages of, again, those histiocytes. Um, and if you search around, you know, again, it's kind of these tubercular granules are around uh, nerves and, and the nexal structures. And, so, and that's very characteristic of tubercular leprosy. Okay. And here's just some pictures of it. We'll kind of push through that though. So again, just a reminder, um, you know, Hansen's disease would be the eponym. Uh, lepro prominous leprosy, of course, is, is typically uh, more multibacillary. That's involving your humoral immunity, whereas tubercular leprosy is, is typically posse-bacillary. So if you throw a fight stain on that, or uh, if you have a fluorescent scope and you can do an ormine rhodamine, um, or you know, something like that, it, it is probably still going to be completely negative. Uh, and tubercular leprosy is, is an evidence of the cell mediated immunity uh, kind of being activated. Um, and so uh, there you go, there's those features. All right, so the last two cases, because uh, again, I, I want to kind of get through these, um, are from a humanitarian mission that I was able to do with a resident. Um, you know, being in the military, we have the opportunity often to do these humanitarian missions. Uh, and, and I was able to participate in one to Guyana, which is not Ghana, that's of course in South Africa or, or in Africa, but um, Guyana is in South America. Um, and uh, it's pretty close to Brazil and, and um, you know, you can see in Venezuela. And um, the goal, you know, we basically kind of lived there for a couple of weeks in these tents and these buildings. And uh, there was uh, some, you know, military um, construction um, services there trying to like help build, uh, you know, homes and churches and, and things like that, or, or whatever, you know, uh, facilities that the towns needed. But then of course they had a medical mission and, you know, we basically just slept in these cots and, and uh, this is actually our little dermatology clinic. I made a little sign um, and we would see just tons of patients. So they had you know, primary care there, they had optometrists there, they had dentists there, they had a lot of different uh, medical uh, specialties, um, but uh, mostly primary care, uh, internal medicine, that sort of thing, pediatrics. Um, but then uh, also, thankfully, had dermatology. We were able to see a lot of amazing things there. Lots of bugs. So just kind of staying with this theme, right? There's a lot of bugs, infestations, uh, infections um, down there in South America where we were at, uh, particularly close to the Amazon. Um, and uh, the typical slide animations aren't really working here. But you can see, you know, all of the just crazy bugs. Um, that's actually an eel moth, something we learned about in dermatology uh, that can leave uh, characteristic markings. Um, and then just tons of actually pretty beautiful moths uh, that we would see down there. Um, so lots of potential for different infestations, infections, bites, things like that, that can produce some interesting um, clinical or cutaneous findings, but then also some potentially cool derm path thing. So case five was a 22 year old female, actually one of the nurses, one of the military nurses that was there, deployed there. She came in to see us one day because um, we would also see the, you know, our, our, the military people. And she says, hey, there's this tender bump on the bottom of my foot. It's been there a few weeks. And of course, we ask her about different uh, exposures. And she says, well, I mean, I did play volleyball in this little sand pit with bare feet. And then also was doing yoga uh, barefoot in a tent. But other than that, you know, their exposures. So this was the patient. And you can see that uh, the nice circumscribed little papule there with a tiny little hole right in the center is actually very important. Um, and there's a, there's a differential here, but really you do think of, um, you know, something infectious or potential infestation, uh, especially with it being more acutely um, uh, reported. And then this is the biopsy, right? So this would be the unknown. Now, certainly, um, after you've done a little bit of derm path education, you would hopefully look at this and say, there's something foreign here. I mean, this is not just some typical oma or itis. This is some sort of organism. And when you look closer uh, at this, you can tell, um, you know, all the buzzwords, all the key features are that we have um, classically acral skin. Um, you can see here, we also have um, the, this, you know, gravid female organism. It's, it's actually a flea. Um, and you, it, these um, classically have these lateral spines that kind of help it to adhere in the skin. Now, you can't really see it as much 
um, here, but you know, there, there's the little um, uh, like indentations into the dermis you can, uh, uh, or the epidermis there um, that you can see. And uh, sometimes you can actually see the signs of the, the little spines there. Um, that's characteristic of this organism. Um, and then of course, there's, uh, there's just the internal um, components of this flea that are features technically, because you know, when you see red hollow tubules and blood in the gut and, and striated muscle in the epidermis, I mean, those things are not of course supposed to be there. Um, and so this ended up being um, a tungiasis, which of course is a sand flea. And so just a really cool case of that. Over here, you can kind of see a little bit better um, where uh, the, those um, indentations from those lateral spines kind of push in. And then as, as of course, tissue processing, it, it's going to shrink a little bit. But this is a, you know, a foreign um, uh, organism, right? This is not supposed to be in the skin. Uh, we can see all those internal components and parts of this organism. So just some pictures there. Uh, we've already kind of gone through these features. Uh, there's that striated muscle. So again, that's also a, a, something you would not see typically in, in most um, skin biopsies even, because uh, most uh, muscle we see is smooth muscle, like polyrectal muscles and whatnot, unless you're getting pretty deep in a skeletal muscle, or it's an area like an eyelid skin or something like that. Um, so this was tungiasis. There's all the features we just kind of talked about there. And that was just a really cool case. Um, so case six, uh, the last case, this is a 55 year old Guyanese male who presented to a humanitarian clinic is reporting the slowly enlarging skin growths. And the first growth actually appeared 19 years previously on his right knee while working as a prospector in the jungle. And the growth just slowly multiplied and spread over many years. So, I mean, this was 19 years in the making. This did not happen overnight, because uh, I'm going to show you the clinical pictures here in a second. And uh, so, certainly, this is not some emergency, but it was something that, uh, you know, biopsy is still very helpful to make the definitive um, diagnosis. So, this is, these are the pictures from this patient. So, you can see all of these nodules. Um, these large papillal nodules kind of um, you know, within the you know, very exophytic in some areas, um, coalescing, um, almost keloidal in nature, which is uh, part of what gives, uh, you know, one of the different terms for this uh, entity. So these kind of these keloidal exophytic nodules all over his legs. And I mean, this is where it started was on his legs. Well, he had them actually kind of uh, even on his arms and other areas. Um, and again, these have just been slowly growing and, and uh, spreading over many, many, many years. And, you know, he had tried different things, with the local doctors. Um, you can see here more some subcutaneous nodules, which actually is kind of unique uh, and rare, rarely reported for this condition, because um, it implies that they're spread uh, uh, more probably lymphatically, uh, not just um, direct, you know, cutaneously uh, uh, kind of uh, progressing. So this is the biopsy, and this is sort of what you had as the unknown. And so from a dermal standpoint, we see it's not necessarily a squared off punch, but we do see that there is, um, you know, a lot of fibrosis, but, but something here, I mean, there's something kind of just diffusely infiltrating uh, the dermis. It's not really, um, you know, your typical itis pattern though, meaning um, you know, if you think of the old Ackerman algorithms, you think of, you know, uh, diffuse inflammation, usually that would be with a bunch of lymphocytes, very blue. You think of lymphomas, you think of, uh, you know, other things, maybe lupus on the differential, uh, if it's superficial deep, kind of parry everything or diffuse top to bottom, left to right, wall to wall. Um, certainly there's mixed inflammation in here, but there's a lot of pale, uh, uh color from scan. And there's something else going on here. This isn't just some, you know, um, uh, you know, lymphoma. You could again always think of an oma, right? We're always trying to think of what else could this be. This could be some sort of neoplasm. So of course we need to go in deeper. We need to kind of look closer to get us a better idea. And so as you get in closer, hopefully it pops, right? That there, um, you know, no pun intended, that there are all of these little tiny organisms. And then it also does, by the way, if you look around, it is, uh, you know, it's not, um, this has been going on for so long. This isn't a very robustly separative um, process anymore, but it still does fit into a, a separative from granulomas pattern. You can see that there are some histiocytes if you searched around and even some rare giant cells. Um, 
But again, the organisms are going to be kind of the most important thing. And so you see these organisms, these little cleared out organisms. And, um, you know, some of them um, even appear to be connecting. Now, anytime you, you see these, and this is a, a fungal um, organism, the fungal organisms are going to be in different stages. So some of them, uh, you know, and I'm no fungal experts, but, you know, there's different uh, morulating phases and spherules and, 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 you know, endospores and all these different terms that are used that, uh, again, I'm not an expert, but in other words, there's going to be, sometimes they're going to be cleared out um, and just this, just kind of that cell wall membrane that's left. And sometimes there's going to be material within it that almost makes it look mimic an inflammatory cell. So you need to be able to distinguish that. Um, but uh, these, uh, you know, clear, um, you know, very really characteristic size of these organisms that uh, appear to be even connected and uh, form these characteristic pot bead chains. And that is a little bit of what you can see. Um, and if you zoom around, I mean, these are, of course, just all over the place. Um, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to necessarily, um, you know, search uh, ad nauseum. Um, but again, you know, certainly some of these are, are connected. If you zoom in super close, let's see if I can get a little closer. Yeah, you can actually see that there is a little connection here. Um, and, and that is that very narrow based um, replication that forms that pop bead uh, appearance. Uh, it's very characteristic for this. This is lobomycosis, which also formed the, that characteristic um, clinical findings. Um, and, you know, there was, we, we did actually two biopsies, one from you know, different locations, one from the arm as well, uh, since that was a little bit different. Um, and I also do want to highlight again, just that fibrosis, this is chronic fibrosis that's all throughout here. Um, but just a really cool and, and somewhat rare case, you know, we don't see this that often, you know, day to day. Um, but uh, um, and from a size standpoint, remember from when it comes to fungus, you know, you think of, is it super small? Is it larger? And, and, and size can make a difference when it comes to uh, the, the potential entities uh, and the differential. So these are about midway between a large coccidiomycosis um, organism and between that and a small little, you know, histo, uh, more, more regular histo. But if you recall, lobo is from a size standpoint, pretty close to African histoplasmosis. Um, which I've you know, never seen a case of that personally, uh, but you know, just from a textbook you know, learning standpoint and, and from a testing standpoint. So here's just some other pictures. And um, you know, we, um, I kind of played around with different ways to look at this, by the way, when I brought this case back and uh, worked it up. Um, and uh, you can see that when you put the condenser down, it actually makes it, it kind of makes that refractility of that cell wall pop. And you can really see uh, some of the pop be, be nature again, not no pun intended, uh, but uh, it's just very helpful um, to, uh, to kind of have that condenser to be able to highlight that almost like you can do with tinian stratum corneum if you happen to have that condenser, which of course you're not gonna have on a digital uh, derm path core exam or, or, a, or you know, similar you know, path exam per se, maybe you won't have a, a condenser to play around with. Um, and then also we just did just just uh, for kind of educational value did a, a GMS and a PAS, and so we can see some pictures here. And again, it really shows how these line up and connect and form those uh, pop beads. This is the PAS here, and just a really uh, cool cool case, um, and very unique and something that still you'd still see. You know, we learn about these, um, but sometimes you think, ah, I'm never going to see that. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, in the military, we, we often may see these, uh, but these, uh, some of these patients, um, you know, may be uh, traveling through the U.S. or uh, might be some sort of um, evacuation or something that may happen. I mean, you can still see these, certainly, um, especially at university centers and teaching centers. So, again, this is lobo mycosis, large organisms, um, not as large as coccidium mycosis, um, but, uh, but similar size to African histo. Um, there's usually some histocytes, some, some giant cells around, maybe a little suburb granulomatous infiltrate. Um, and that is it. So um, I just wanted to say, let me kind of stop screen sharing here. So thank you again um, for allowing me to participate. Hopefully this was educational um, and uh, just some really cool cases. Uh, and, and infections and infestations are always great and kind of fun. Um, and they, they like to put those on the different exams, uh, board exams, core exams, whatever. 
um, uh, just because they're, they're just highly testable, even though they may not be that common. Uh, but uh, again, thank you, and I hope you um, uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. Well, that was great. Uh, hope, hope everybody uh, learned some stuff. And uh, again, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to, uh, to email us, education at sagesdx.com. Hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you.